the breadth of knowledge in many disciplines, and he has a very wide uh, vision, and he's a doer, which uh, allowed the, uh, to, make, to arrive with the Bibliotheca Alexandrina since its birth until today, we're only five years old of its status where it is today. Uh, and he's, uh, he's been always doing this while pushing youngs and the youth forward. He's a, he's a great believer in the youth, and he practices what he believes. Uh, and this is manifested in the Library of Alexandria, where the average age of all employees is uh, 29. Um, and uh, he refers to himself as an old person. And this makes us very depressed, because uh, we see and feel that he is much younger than any of us, not only in the spirit, but also in energy and the pace. We have 2,000 people in the library who are running around in order to keep up with him. So welcome me in, in, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Ismail Saragetzin, the director of the Library of Alexandria. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Noha. Thank you, friends of Wikimania, for being here and uh, for bringing this new vision that you represent to uh, where uh, we all hope it will take us. Uh, I will be a little more somber in what I have to say uh, because I think I should also mention some of the challenges that we all face. And I was encouraged to do so in preparing for this uh, uh, introductory presentation by the fact that I was told that the title would be Changing the Shape of Wisdom. And I thought about that. And I said, yes, that's true. We need new paradigms for new tomorrows. So I'll say a few words about problems and promises, something about freedom of expression, freedom of access, and what the BA is doing, although I'm very grateful to Florence for having said those nice things about us, and uh, a word of defense of values, and yes, no hard defense of youth. So uh, every time you see one of those red slides, you'll know I'm moving on to the next topic, and I'm getting closer to the end, so don't worry too much. Let's start. First of all, we are, of course, living the era of globalization, where nation states are becoming less important than they were before. They still are important, but they're less important. And for the first time, people all over the planet can, in fact, communicate with each other. For many, this has meant economic opportunity. It has meant huge new markets that didn't exist before. Societies that move ever faster in terms of transformation. And I think that you were, uh, many of you were in Taipei recently. You know East Asia. I think I know that part of the world reasonably well. Been going there since the 70s. And the transformations that took place there are truly amazing. Uh, regretfully, the pace on the financial markets is equally uh, fast-paced, but for some of us it may be blowing a fuse. And although it has generated great wealth for some people, it is equally true that it is leaving a lot of people behind. It is equally true that in practically every country in the world, disparities in income are beginning to be felt. And in many parts of the world, this globalization is not seen as something that is enormously beneficial and opening a lot of opportunities, but a feeling that they're being crushed by enormous interests that are outside of their control. Now, against this backdrop, of course, we also have an ongoing population growth on the planet, which is pushing our population from the six, six and a half billion we were at to around eight and a half to nine billion, with the natural result that whereas once before we lived in harmony with nature, we are increasingly putting pressure on natural resources. There are probably more fisher folk here than there are fish in this image from Bangladesh. We've destroyed our patrimony of forests in many parts of the world and continuing to do so at present. We're suffering enormous soil erosion at a rate that should not be minimized. And of course, our lifestyles are polluting the water on which we depend, for without water there is no life. Our energy consumption is uh, not what it should be and too much relying on fossil fuels. This, of course, is an image of Los Angeles, but there are many or any modern city would look the same. And the question is, for these children growing up in Africa, will they have access and the right to clean air, clean water, and fertile soils? 
surely these are fundamental rights that should be governed for them. So it's not enough to celebrate the earth and all its inhabitants and its diversity. We really must restore what we destroyed. We have 850 million people going hungry today. And we have people who are locked into poverty, extreme poverty, as you can see in these images. And starvation is still a fact of life in many of the countries that I've spent a good part of my life working in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And against that, we also have a huge tidal wave of young children pressing at the gates for education. Young people, this comes from India, this picture is from India, young people pressing against the cities for some form of employment, but where regretfully they lack the skills. And societal transformations are taking place. Women have made great progress in some parts of the world. In other parts of the world, they're still held back by uh, 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 the existing circumstances and poverty. In other parts of the world, they have uh, societal constraints on some of what they do. And although we have successfully pushed back the specter of nuclear holocaust that existed at the time of the Cold War, we have learned that security is not assured just because the end of a war between states. And worse than that, we are witnessing disastrous situations in many countries of the world where wars are taking casualties on a scale that's almost unprecedented. And the fact that they're called civil wars really doesn't make much difference to the people who are dying. We have a legacy of past wars. And in Egypt, we are one of the countries that suffers most for land, from landmines. We had Al Alamein, and we had the great battles, uh, tank battles between Rommel and Montgomery in the Second World War. But we have millions of landmines in that part of the world. And that is still a great break on our ability to develop. And its continuing claims are disastrous. We have what the UN calls euphemistically IDPs. IDPs are so-called internally displaced persons. Uh, they are refugees, but the fact that they haven't crossed a political border into another country somehow makes them a different category of problem. We have, of course, confrontations between state authorities and populations, and we have wars that are ongoing everywhere in some of the poorest places in the world. And in sub-Saharan Africa or in Africa as a whole, you have serious conflicts, and what is worse, children are being robbed of their youth and their childhood and pressed into service as killers and murderers in child soldiers in various militias. And of course, even in Europe, where we promised it would never happen again, we have seen the killing fields in places like Yugoslavia. The great powers are not immune from participating in wars, in bringing their political and military might to bear. And I question, I question, where are the priorities that we have? We who are involved with humanitarian action in Darfur are asking for 13 helicopters, 13. NATO has 7,000 of them, 7,000. Do you think they really cannot spare 13 helicopters out of 7,000? I ask you. Well, we talked about students and classes. And Dr. Hoda Baraka was talking about equipment in classes. How much does it cost? Oh, we all worry about that. How much does it cost to equip a soldier? Do you know? Just think about that. The world met and set Millennium Development Goals to eradicate extreme poverty and hunger, achieve universal primary education, promote gender equality, and so on and so on, which you all know very well. But for any of that, we shall need peace. We cannot continue to wage war, to put enormous resources in war today while we still want to achieve these objectives and claim somehow that we do not have the resources to do what we need to do. I find this picture a very moving one. This child trying to salvage some books from the ravage and the rubble of momming. And now I will call on one of my star witnesses. I think you all know this guy. I don't think anybody doesn't know Napoleon Bonaparte. 
And the reason I call on Napoleon Bonaparte is because of what he had to say, being who he is. He said, do you know what astonished me most in the world? It is the inability of force to create anything. In the long run, the sword is always beaten by the spirit. And in fact, Napoleon's legacy is precisely that. His victories and defeats in the military fields were ephemeral and disappeared. His legacy has been the civil code, the notion of a legal system that is structured and the education system of the Lycée Francais and the Grandes Écoles that he did, including the establishment of the Bank of France. So if there are Millennium Development Goals, there are unstated goals of peace and justice, and that requires obvious reminders that there is no security without peace, there is no peace without justice, there is no justice without equity, and there is no equity without inclusion. A global consensus has been formed around that, and that global consensus coming out of the agonies of the 20th century is captured by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, whose anniversary, 60th anniversary, we are celebrating this year, and yet somehow it passes almost unnoticed. Human rights is now everywhere. The topic that we demand, the topic for which we say democracy is the best guarantor, and to guarantee human rights, we have the universal declaration that all the countries have adhered to. And I call on my own country and other countries in this region to remove the, the reservations that they have put on certain clauses and to accept the universal declaration of human rights. It was, after all, a crowning legacy for a remarkable woman. Eleanor Roosevelt was the driving force behind the adoption of the uh, Universal Declaration in 1948. And today, the idea of human rights for all, rights that are inalienable by virtue of being human, not because of your political views, not because of your color, your gender, your nationality, your religion, or your language, but because you are human, you have rights to these. And that has been reaffirmed in this Millennium Summit. And I call on Article 19 of the Human Rights Declaration, which states everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. And this right includes the freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. So my friends, the exercises we are involved in whether here in this conference or beyond this conference in what we do, have a lot to do with the exercise of freedom. And it is through that exercise of freedom that we shall reaffirm the, politi the polity and the community of nations and individuals and communities who share that commitment to fundamental human rights. Books will remain a great form of expression. Personally, I go with Jorge Borges' great quotation I imagine paradise as some kind of library, but then I'm biased. But there are those who would ban books. There are those who forbid books. And here in the Library of Alexandria, we are the depository of all the bibliography of banned books in the world. And we lead a project called the Beacon for Freedom with the Central Library of Norway. And there are those who advocate censorship for all sorts of reasons, mostly national security. You have the Patriot Act in the United States. You have the efforts in the UK government to extend preventive detention. You have discussions ongoing here and everywhere. But a fundamentally, censorship contravenes human rights. The multiplicity of opinions is what the Article 19 is all about. And thanks to the new technologies and the bloggers and the readers who are creating new communities, that freedom of expression and freedom of access will not be denied because you cannot, can you like stand before the waves and try to roll back the tide with orders. They will move forward, there will be others and many more. And frankly, I kind of like this one. It sums it up much more briefly than I have been saying it, but the same idea is there. Uh, I think it captures the spirit of what we have to say. There's another form of censorship, and that is social pressure against individuals, not political censorship, not censorship by the states, but social pressure, whether it be done on a religious basis or on an ideological basis. Many of you here are too young to remember this, 
This is the little red book of Chairman Mao being held aloft. And all other books were to be destroyed in China when the great cultural revolution was going on. And they blocked the schools and they took the teachers out to re-education centers and so on. And here we have had also strong expressions. It is fine to express their views, but it is important to be tolerant of engaging with those who hold different views. And freedom of expression must be protected. Today, we have to fight these battles again and again and again. It seems to me that sometimes we forget that the battles for freedom of expression have to be refought every generation. In Egypt in 1926, Ta, Ta Hussein, the great writer Ta Hussein, whom we see here, was tried for apostasy and he was acquitted. The case was dismissed. Ideas would not be tried in court. Yet, exactly 70 years later, Nasr Hamid Abu Zaid was found guilty of almost an identical story. The battles we wage have got to be fought every generation again, for freedom of expression is fundamentally part of our human rights. And I know that my human rights will be diminished if I allow the human rights of others to be diminished. And that is what this international community can now increasingly push forward. But there is another and more subtle aspect to this, which is freedom of access. Because the availability or somebody to express their views is one thing, but the recipient on the other side is something else. In fact, print can sometimes be out of reach. Not simply because the books are out of print, although 70% of the titles are out of print and under copyright. It is because of the price. So the new technologies can help. The new technologies can provide all information to all people at all times. For the first time in history, we can actually do this. We are reviving the tradition of the ancient library of Alexandria, not so much by collecting all the scrolls of the world, but by making them available to all the people of the world through the marvelous inventions of the internet and inventions like the wikis, where people can become producers of their own knowledge as well as consumers of the benefits of it. And that requires the free flow of information. The free flow of information is a fundamental part, both of freedom of expression and of human rights. And I'm happy to say, Dr. Ahmed Darwish was here a little while earlier, we held here a hearing for a new law. As you can see here, the law, Egypt is one of the countries where national freedom of information laws is pending. And we had a hearing here in the library for a two-day conference with lots of people discussing whether the free flow of information that was being proposed in the law was adequate or we should do more. But accessing the information, we've had a problem. In the past, in developing countries, we've had a shortage of books. So it's like somebody trying to drink water and there's an enormous drought and then comes one drop on my tongue and it's very difficult, I can't drink out of it. Then suddenly, with the internet, it's like somebody opening a fire hose on me. And I can't drink out of a fire hose either. I need somehow a way to package it just right so that I can interact with it. Wikipedia, the bloggers, others are doing these functions of the packaging that we need. And what we need, therefore, is to ensure that that properly packaged water can be drunk by the children, and not just the children of the rich, but also the children of the poor. That is a big challenge because at present, speaking of water, 1.2 billion people are still scrounging around with unsanitary water, such as this woman picking some water out of the mud for her family. And sometimes, copyright issues can put things tantalizingly out of reach. And thus, we have to find ways of addressing that. But what is this mysterious copyright? Well, copyright is really a, a long-standing invention. And it's also one of the aspects of human rights. In Article 27, Part B, it says, everyone has the right to the protection of the moral and material interests resulting from any scientific, literary, or artistic protect protection for which is the author. Now, this text is also reminiscent of what we find in the Constitution of the United States in Article 1, although I also have something more to say about that, and which is enshrined in international agreements of various sorts. But my credo, to put my cards on the table from the beginning, is all information to all people at all times. 
and I think we should compensate innovators and authors must benefit, but the public must have broad access. That is fundamental not just for democracy, but also for the benefits of society. And in fact, copyright is a social contract between innovators and creators on the one hand, and society on the other. Society says, we will give you for a limited time unique monopolistic rights on the results of your creation in exchange for uh, making that widely available. So that exchange exists. And therefore, we should recognize that others who are entering this game are facilitators of the basic agreement between creators and users. The publishers, the printers, the distributors, the sellers are facilitators. And they should get remunerated for the service. But they should not hijack the property and say, now I am a commercial company and I own the copyright to the work of X, Y, or Z. We need to resolve that. Libraries, museums, archives, depositories are there to serve the public and should price their services accordingly. So the fundamental mistake has been that by extending copyright for a very long period, we're making it a de facto perpetual monopoly. It's resulting in a situation where 70% of the titles in the world today are under copyright and out of print. I think Jimmy Wales and I were discussing this yesterday and he was saying we should have a use it or lose it policy. You cannot withhold information from the public by maintaining copyright and not allowing other people to reproduce it. Well, where did this come from? Well, it came from a monopolistic practice that started as early as the printing press and immediately early in England in 1474, the Caxton Bill, where they gave the copy, right, written P-Y-E, to someone, a printer, not the author, uh, because they figured it was easier to control a few printing houses than it would be to control thousands of people who write. There was a lot of working with government on this, and in 1710, something called the Statute of Anne, Queen Anne, limited the copyright to 14 years and gave the printer's monopoly 21 years to disappear. This is Queen Anne, and uh, she put in force this first bill. Now, the American Constitution addresses that. The American Constitution, as you know, came about in 1787, adopted in 1789, the first election. And it's very interesting because we know from the framers of the Constitution what they meant by that text. I have read the exchanges of letters between Madison and Jefferson, and Madison was proposing 14 years for copyright, and Jefferson said, no, 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 that's too little. It should be 19 years. And Jefferson based his point of view that the earth belongs in usufruct to the living. Therefore, the living are the ones who should be benefiting from it. And he uh, asked for 19 instead of 14 years. And that's when you look at the American Constitution, uh, uh, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, you will see for a limited time. Now, limited time, we know what they meant when they drafted limited time, and in fact, the first Copyright Act of the United States in 1790 was for 14 years. So how did we get where we are? Well, it was extended. 14 years, renewable once, 28 years with a second renewal of 14 years in 1909, 28 with another 28, in 1976, author's life plus 50 years, in 1986, author's life plus 70 years, now it's author's life plus 75 years, then plus uh, 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 in perpetuity for a commercial copyright. That undermines the spirit which we're looking for. And the problem is that we are still looking at the issue of authors and proprietors at the same time. And that's a big issue because uh, the United States initially, incidentally, did not extend those rights except to citizens and residents, which resulted in American piracy of British books. And why? Well, it enabled Charles Dickens, 1843, his Christmas Carol was sold for six cents in the United States and $2.50 in England. Uh, Dickens had to come for lecture tours in the United States in order to sell books at a higher rate, signed copies. But the fact remains that the notion at the time was the United States needed access to that information. Well, today we have to rethink a lot of these things. We have the creators on the one hand, the users on the others, the printers, publishers, and distributors should not 
be confused as proprietors. They are there to facilitate the agreement. And that is one of the tensions that exists. We saw it in the music field. We're seeing it in the downloads on music. We're seeing it in, in, in the film. And we're going to increasingly see it in books as well. Well, what is the BA doing about that, given our creed that I said before? Well, for one of the things, we were born digital. And therefore, we're committed to that credo. And we honor the past, celebrate the present, and embrace the future. And I invite you, as Florence said, to actually visit and see for yourself. From the past, we try to digitize manuscripts and make them available for people to take with them, as well as online. Uh, one of our seven research centers, which is in Cairo, Kaltnat, has actually produced an archaeological map of Egypt where all the information is available online. And you can click like that and get an actual site. There are the pyramids, but you can go to a tomb like that, and then you have a plan here, and you can navigate the tomb, and then go to this wall here, and then you get this text, and you highlight the text, and you get an English translation of it, and uh, so on and so forth. We do that for buildings in Cairo, or by individual building, or by street, or by architect. And all of this is presented in a very beautiful display here, which is a nine-screen interactive computer, or also online in eternalegypt.org. We recreated the ancient Pharos, the lighthouse of Alexandria, in a computer simulation. And we are building something called the memory of modern Egypt, starting with the great description de l'Egypte, a huge work that was done by scientists who came with Napoleon Bonaparte to Egypt in 1798. And they produced about 3,000 drawings in 950 pages of, uh, of plates in huge volumes and about 7,500 pages of text in nine volumes. We digitized all this material, made it available on the internet with virtual browsers and search capabilities. That is on the one side. On the other side, we have Sadat and Nasser, and we're doing complete archives for enormous materials, 50,000 uh, pictures, uh, 1,400 speeches, audio and text, songs, uh, text by hand, uh, documents from uh, the US Foreign Office, from the UK Foreign Office, etc. We've also done two and a half million documents of the Suez Canal period. They were filling in between the Nasser Sadat period and the beginning of the 19th century, and uh, with all sorts of other institutions in between. That is part of how we want to make all this information about the past accessible, available, user-friendly. We celebrate the present in working on e-content, and we are involved with a number of uh, uh, groups in what we call the Million Book Project, and we are digitizing uh, uh, Arabic books at about 5,000 a, a month in this space. And we're also designing science. We facilitate science through something called the BA Super Course, which uh, is online, but we also make these little DVDs. We distribute them, provided you can get it as a gift, provided you agree to share it with at least five more people. No sales, free. Everything has to be free. And this is a super course. We now have 40,000 teachers from 175 countries using these 3,400 lectures as they see fit anywhere. It is a free gift that is meant to be given. We give that because sometimes it's easier for people than to download from the internet when they have slow connections. We work with the World Bank to bring information about development, the development gateway. We Arabized their, the website, and it's now available locally. But we embrace the future by promoting reform in our societies, reform that will be more in tune with the values that we just described where a vibrant civil society is needed for any lasting reform, and we want a credible and recognized figure to give that. We brought the people together here. These were the drafting committees, the debates that took place, and they produced something called the Alexandria Declaration, which five years ago, four and a half years ago, laid out a plan of action for political reform, economic reform, social reform, and cultural reform. All of that is available on this website, both in Arabic and in English and in French. The, uh, this declaration spawned many other activities, including a lot of emphasis on protecting freedom of expression, because without it, there really will not be any transparency, any accountability, any participation that will be possible. We've created the Arab Info Mall, where we have about 720 uh, Arab NGOs participating, registered, and using this platform and forum. We're also working with the Ministry of Education on assisting teachers with the French Academy of Science who've Arabized their website, La Map, which has this architecture incidentally on an open source system to make material available for teachers in the classrooms. 
We've created a digital assets repository which allows different kinds of, of material to be looked up, including books, including uh, uh, objects. We have VISTA, a virtual immersive science and technology application, a virtual reality 3D simulation that you can actually go into and sit inside. You wear these glasses and you are really living with it. You can look at analyses of cuts of geological and seismic data to figure out where to drill your wells for oil or water. We can do medicine. Uh, lots of uh, very interesting 3D variations. I think Florence mentioned some of that. Here's a heart with all its uh, connections as compared to the flat two-dimensional uh, MRIs. Uh, we applied that to the Sphinx. We studied uh, with IBM Egypt and the Council of Antiquities how the simulation of the erosion that would take place on the Sphinx from the wind and the sand, and we did various models. And like a tomography, we find the red spots are those that are most vulnerable, including the famous left shoulder of the Sphinx here, and we went on. We did a, a model for the, the library itself, and you can navigate that model and go inside it and visit every space in the library as well. The VISTA is a tool as part of a greater uh, uh, means of discussing pe with people this 3D uh, reality. You, know, you can enter inside the molecules and see how they're connected with each other and where their places are. The Internet Archive was mentioned. It is a huge mass storage uh, approach. Uh, of course, it started by uh, Bruce Kerr in San Francisco. We're the only complete copy right now. We synchronize with them. And these PETA boxes, these, these racks that you see here are huge. One rack, if you took a book of 300 pages and digitized it into text, you could put 100 million books into one rack. And if the book is fully formatted with color and diagrams and so on, take about 12 million books. So uh, you can see the volume of material that we have there, and I'm happy to say we are now assembling these in Egypt. We're trying to extend our connectivity with the rest of the world so that we can work, our scientists, our young scientists can work online in real time with others as well. So a digital future is here, and we want to partner with open source efforts. Of course, Wiki is by far the most important. Wikipedia was the trigger for many of us, but we recognize that it's not just that the wiki revolution has done Wikipedia, it has started the whole new era with so many other things that we saw in the earlier presentation today. Harold Varmus came here, he's a Nobel laureate, former head of the NIH, and the, the, the founder and supporter of the Public Library of Science, and he too believes in open access to knowledge, and we've been working with him as well. And of course, we're trying whenever possible, whenever possible, not always, but to use Unix and promote it. We can have all the material available at all times in digital form, including that which is out of print, and we have the Espresso Book Machine to do that. And the model we'd like to suggest is consult for free paper download or paper print by the copy. So the future in terms of technology is looking very bright. The future in terms of society is another story. Future in terms of technology, undoubtedly, we're expanding into faster, better, stronger, larger computers, and we're expanding the our brains reach all the time and a whole lot more. But we have to think about society and values and those images I showed you at the beginning. So let me say a few words in defense of values. We talk about the knowledge-based society. Knowledge is more than information. In fact, if you take data and you organize data, you have information. If you interpret information, you have knowledge. But knowledge by itself is not the same thing as wisdom. To make wise decisions is different from knowledgeable decisions. Well, just look at a few decisions about wars. Science brings data, information, and knowledge, but it cannot address the issue of wisdom. If you ask a question, what should I do about A, B, or C, there is no scientific answer. There is no scientific answer for that class of questions. You have to seek wisdom elsewhere. And wisdom really requires that we rethink the values that govern our behavior. We talk about honor, courage, compassion, common sense, dignity, loyalty, respect, fairness, to which I can add the love of nature, appreciation of the arts, and tolerance, as we have seen recently in issues of immigration in certain countries in Europe. We're a very tolerant society, but if you don't behave exactly like us, you can go back where your bloody well came from. 
And I think that all of us who are involved with the pursuit of knowledge are in some way scientists, and we promote the values of science. And the values of science are a profound commitment to truth, to truth. Any scientist who fabricates data is completely removed from the roles of scientists everywhere in the world. He can be wrong in interpreting the data, but the reporting of the results has to be fair. The second worst crime is plagiarism. We need to respect creativity and imagination, and then we live with a certain constructive subversiveness. By that I mean that the paradigm of science advances by overthrowing the old paradigm. And thus we always expect that the existing authority is going to be overturned. And therefore that forces a tolerance of engagement with the new, when new ideas emerge like Einstein saying space-time and energy and matter are not what we think they are from Newtonian physics. He was only 26 years old and an unknown person, but people came to grips with the idea and actually it overthrew Newton. It doesn't diminish our respect for Newton or for Einstein when others will advance. And science has a method for the arbitration of disputes that is based on rationality, evidence, and discussion. These are values that we need, and we're guided by these values, not just for the exercise of science, but in thinking through how the wise policies that we need to adopt. We need to remember that what we're doing to the earth today is not an earth we inherited from our parents, but as it has been said before, we have borrowed it from our children. And that will require participation, something that you in the wiki community have shown the world can be done on a scale that others thought was not possible. And what we know is that when you do have participation, the civil society forces governments to be responsive and forces governments to be, in fact, capable of being held to account. It was pioneering work done by Putnam on Italy. Italy, as you know, has a rich north, very industrialized and advanced, and a poor south. And the question was, they have the same government, same constitution, same currency, same central bank, same macro policy, so why is the north and the south so different? And he did a study, and he found almost corresponds to the rate of what he called the most civic to the least civic. The north is more civic. So the question was, do the socioeconomic structures that we see in the north, are they the result of the civic organizations that existed there, or do they have these intensive civic organizations because they were rich? Ask the question. So because it was Italy, he could go back to the 1900s, and then the structures in the 70s, and he was looking at the observed performance in the 90s, and he postulated different ways of looking at it. He tested all of those, and here's the result of his testing. The width of the arrow shows the strength of the relationship. And I think it's very clear that participation is what leads to responsive government, is what leads to economic growth, rather than the other way around. And that means empowerment. That means that meeting together with people, engaging them, and encouraging them, even those who are most destitute, you have a chance to bring them into the process and not marginalize them from decision-making that concerns them. This is from Siwa, one of the poorest places, the Self-Employed Women's Association in India, and where, in fact, by dealing with their economic problems, they became active citizens in making decisions. Civil society networks thrive on information flows. We're back to freedom of information, freedom of information flow. And with participation, we can then address the purpose of social action. And here I will stop to use a parable, the story of the flute and the children. You're going by, and you run, and there are three children with a flute, and they say, we want you to adjudicate who should get the flute. And so the first one says, I'm very poor, I have no toys, the other two are very rich, they have lots of toys, and the other two kids don't contest that. So you would say, well, give him the flute. Okay, rewind the tape, here we are again, same situation, except the girl says, I'm the only one who knows how to play the flute. I'm a musician, I love playing the flute, they love listening to me play the flute. They just blow on it like a, like a whistle. It's terrible. Uh, I'm the one who should get it, they benefit from listening to it, I enjoy it, I make use of it. And the others don't contest that. And again you would say, well that sounds like a good reason, we'll give you that. Back again, third time around, the kid says, I don't care how poor he is or how talented she is, I made the flute. I took a piece of wood, I made the holes in it, I made the flute. So who should get it? Well, what we have seen here is equity, utility, and entitlement, three 
criteria for social choice. They frequently are confused in the issues. But in fact, there is no right answer for that. There is no scientific answer. But there's an answer that comes from the participation of society in the decision making that brings forth all of these issues to design appropriate actions that brings agreement on these criteria for choice. And that will require that we empower the weak because that is part of social justice. And thus we have to look from the economic disempowerment to rewards, those who have military force, those who have cultural norms, those who have political decision-making power to really bring in the others. And that usually requires wise leadership. Now, youth can also lead. You are all here, you are all leaders of your community, you are all leaders of the world. And so, my last bit is on defense of youth. I mentioned Newton. Well, by age 30, Newton had revolutionized optics, the nature of light, thought out gravitation, invented the calculus, became a full professor at Cambridge, and was elected a fellow at the Royal Society. It was no slouch. Einstein, we celebrated here two years ago, in 1905, the miraculous year, where he brought out molecular dimensional Brownian motion photoelectric effect, for which he won the Nobel Prize, the special theory of relativity, and his famous equation E equals mc squared. Forty years later, you know, the revolutionary aspects that energy and matter are the same thing, and that this amount of energy in a very small amount of matter, of course, was proven uh, uh, in dramatic form 40 years later. But it came out of the inventive mind of an unknown 26-year-old who did not have a PhD, was not working at a university, and was uh, functioning at the uh, uh, patent office in Bern, Switzerland at the time. Werner Heisenberg, he of the uncertainty principle, he was at age 24 when he formulated quantum mechanics and the uncertainty principle at age 26 and won the Nobel Prize at age 31. Paul Dirac, at age 24, did his major work on quantum mechanics. By 26, he formulated the full quantum treatment and he predicted antimatter. And in fact, the positron was found three, four years later. And at age 31, he shared the Nobel Prize with Schrodinger. DNA, Jim Watson was 25 at the time of 1953, and Francis Crick was 31. Closer to our field, Alan Turing. Alan Turing, the father of computation, in 1936, born 1912, 1936, 24 years old, he formulates the Turing machine and creates the field of computation, a new field in math, and the idea of the Turing machine and the idea of computable numbers. Claude Shannon, the father of information theory, author of the famous Shannon equations, distinguished between message and noise. Uh, he was only 22 when his master thesis at MIT, a symbolic analysis of relay and switching circuits, brought Boolean algebra to bear on large circuit systems. And between those two, we launched the computer revolution. And the artisans of the information revolution that we are living through today are all very young people indeed. So, ladies and gentlemen, friends, Wikipedians, to change the shape of wisdom we have to trust our youth. We have to trust to the multiplicity of views. We have to trust to the openness of engagement. We have to trust to the rationality of debate. I say to you, as you start your debates, dare to dream and dare to be bold. We can do things differently. Yes, there are forces that are arrayed in society against us, but we can win. We can succeed. I give you two examples. One, Antarctica. Antarctica, this huge constant continent that was discovered uh, uh, was leading people to try to make a, a, a California land rush type of thing on it. Uh, bring in the bulldozers, let's uh, mine, let's look for oil, let's do this. Uh, money interests were lining up, uh, military bases were being parceled out, and then the late Jacques-Yves Cousteau, a good personal friend of mine and others said, no. Let us hold it in its purity, its pristine wilderness, and hold it for science and for the future and for the environment. And they said to him, do you really mean that a whole continent should be just kept for a bunch of penguins? And the answer is yes. And guess what? The Antarctica Agreement was signed. And Antarctica was kept free of military bases and economic interests. And the Antarctica Agreement goes on till 2041. What seemed impossible has been achieved. How about this one? 
1963, Martin Luther King Jr. stands on the steps of the Lincoln Monument addressing the people in Washington and says, I have a dream. And he says, I have a dream that my children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Well, dreams can be realized. It seemed impossible at the time, but it is happening. And it is happening thanks to young people like you who have been engaged in the sweeping change, the tidal change that Barack Obama has triggered by bringing millions of young voters into the political process. And he, his own biography, is called The Audacity of Hope. Can we do any less ourselves? Margaret Mead, she told us, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. So our group may look small and defenseless against the competition. But we will surprise the world. <laughs> and working all together, there is so much we can do for a whole new generation and for the whole world. Thank you.